hello there this is the last lecture of the fourth week we will be winding up with looking at graphs today this will be the last lecture where we will see testing based on coverage and graph coverage criteria for now what i will do today is introduce you to this popular model called finite state machines most of you might be familiar with it and see what kind of graphs they are and how graph coverage criteria will be applicable to them so so far what did we see now we saw graphs structural coverage criteria data flow coverage criteria then we saw how to apply to source code then we saw how to apply them to uh, data flow along with source code in the cfg then we saw how to apply them to design elements specifically we saw how to apply it to sequencing constraints and then i told you some amount of sequencing constraints need you to keep track of state information so when you need to keep track of state information finite state machines or finite state automata come in to be very handy so today we'll introduce those models and see how graph coverage criteria is useful for them another popular design models are what are called uml diagrams uml is basically a unified modeling language a collection of popular diagrams each of which is represented uh, using both graphical and textual notation and is used to document design i will not really be able to give you detailed test case design for uml diagrams but i'll tell you what sort of diagrams basically correspond to finite state automata and how the coverage criteria that we saw till now can be used on them at the end of this lecture we'll revisit the entire graph based testing that we have looked at in the past 3 weeks and i'll briefly recap all that we did what is a finite state machine i hope most of you will be familiar with it if you've done computer science or uh, it you would have seen a course called automata theory or uh, formal languages or theory of computation finite state automata are one of the first models that you will learn in the course so a finite state machine can be thought of as a finite graph the nodes in the graph are what are called states and the edges in the graph are what are called transitions so what do the nodes describe the nodes typically describe what happens to certain variables in software at a certain point in time they tell you the values that these variables take at that point in time what do transitions describe they describe how the machine or the program changes state from uh, one state to the other so if a state depicts the values of certain variables at a certain point in time transition might mean executing a particular statement in the program which results in change of values of one or more states and this results in a new state right mm -hmm. so those are the edges of a finite state machine typically many interesting finite state machine models that are useful for software design always have guards conditions associated with edges triggers associated with nodes and so on right so here is a simple example of a finite state machine it has two states two nodes one called closed one called open states are always given these names with special identifiers which help you to identify what these states are while modeling using finite state machines as we have seen till now there is an incoming arrow at the state closed so this says that closed is an initial state this small toy finite state machine can be thought of as the finite state machine corresponding to an elevator it's a very highly abstract machine but it represents an elevator the elevator could be door could be the closed or it is open and it says that there is a transition or an edge from the state closed to the state open when somebody presses this open door button you could think of it as there being a door button and then when you press that open door button the state machine changes from state closed to state open and what are the preconditions for this transition or this state change to happen preconditions here it is abbreviated as pre in short for precondition it says that the elevator speed should be zero which basically means that the elevator should not be moving if it moves the door cannot be open and it says that somebody should have pressed the open door button so the precondition says that elevator should not be moving its speed should be zero and the trigger is the open button command should have been pressed by somebody if this happens then the machine transitions from uh, close to open of course this is just a small machine it doesn't 
really describe all the transitions or the full behavior or design of an elevator. I just took this abstract level description to explain what a finite state machine is to you. So how are finite state machines useful for us in testing? Finite state automata are very classical models. Uh, any course on automata theory or theory of computation would begin with them. They're very robust models. But we won't really look at finite state automata and the theory and what they mean because our focus is to be able to purely understand it from the point of view of testing. Surprisingly, finite state machines have been around in testing for more than 30 years now and they've always been considered as popular models that have been used for designing test cases to achieve some goal or the other with reference to testing. So typically finite state machines, what do they model? They model design of embedded software, software that sits in cars, planes, phones, toys, etc. They model several abstract data types. Like for example, in the last lecture, we saw Q as an abstract data type, right? So finite state machines can model such abstract data types. Almost all of hardware, hardware circuits can be modeled using finite state machine. Several protocols can be modeled using finite state machine. So a large class of design and design elements can be modeled using finite state machines. And why does this help? Typically, finite state machines model design. And when I create a FSM model for design, I'm doing it before I write code. In fact, my model is good enough. Then there are several tools that process finite state machine design models and automatically generate code. So when I come up with formal models of design, it's been found by past experiences in several projects that such models help you to identify, test and detect errors early even before you begin coding so that these det uh, errors if detected early can save development cost and time right and the other thing is many as i told you many popular modeling notations uh, also support finite state machines the most popular modeling notation is that of uml uml has a diagram one of its diagrams is that of finite state machines the other diagram that it has is state charts which can be thought of as finite state machines with hierarchy and concurrency specific finite state machines and uh, the other thing to note is that whenever i have a control intensive applications right like elevator something controlling something a software controlling an entity right controlling a piece of hardware or a system finite state machines are considered to be very good models for that but suppose i have a data intensive application like something that handles a database server something that uh, processes data and renders it as a high speed gui fsms are not considered good models models for such things we typically don't work with finite state machines for them right so fsms the summary of this slide is that finite state machines are reasonably popular fairly large class of software can be modeled the design of such software can be modeled using finite state machines so it helps to look at our graph coverage criteria on finite state machines and see what they mean right before we move on, I'd like to mention to you that finite state machines are beyond just simple graphs, right? When we saw structural coverage criteria, we saw plain graphs. And uh, when we saw data flow coverage criteria, we saw graphs that were annotated with definitions and uses. Finite state machines have a lot more annotations uh, than data flow graphs. They can be annotated with different types of actions. Actions could be on the transitions of the machine. Actions could be on the nodes, specifically as actions that dictate when to enter a node. Actions could be on the node dictating when to exit from the node. And what do these actions represent? They represent change of values of variables. They represent change of evaluation of conditions, several different things, right? As we saw in the elevator small example, there could be preconditions associated with nodes that tell you when to take a transition out of a node. There could be conditions or guards associated with edges that tell you when to take a particular edge. There could be triggering events and so on. So finite state machines are graphs, but they have a lot of extra add-on information to them. Now let's look at the structural coverage criteria that we saw and see what they mean. So simplest structural coverage criteria that we saw was node coverage. In the context of finite state machine, it means execute every state. 
that makes a lot of sense no when it comes to saying that if a machine models a design then you execute every state in that design right the next coverage criteria is edge coverage it means execute every transition which means execute every state change the third coverage criteria is edge pair coverage execute every pair of transitions now path coverage prime path coverage is not very useful because we don't really look at loops as they come from control flow graphs in finite state machines what would be useful is specified path coverage as we go down the course we will see some more finite state machines where this could be useful for us now let's move on and look at data flow coverage in the data flow coverage when it comes to applying for finite state machines definitions and uses can get very complicated if you go back to the previous slide i told you that there could be actions associated with edges or transitions and then there could be actions associated with nodes and those actions further on could be entry actions or exit actions right so the there could be several different kinds of definitions associated with nodes and edges and the other thing to be noted is that in when we look at control flow graph of code when we say annotations on edges uses on edges they typically occur as predicates that correspond to branching one will be one predicate the other one will be the negation of that predicate in finite state machine two edges coming out of the same node could have very different kinds of guards that are labeling them right some of them could use a certain variables some of them need not use the same variables at all they could use a completely different set of variables so the uses on each edge that comes out of a node could be very different from the other edge that comes out of a node right so data flow coverage criteria gets a little cumbersome when we have to work with it on finite state machine instead what we will do is next week i'll introduce you to logical coverage criteria logic coverage criteria come in handy when it comes to handling data with fsms we will revisit finite state machines at that time right so the other thing i told you is that finite state machines typically model software design or uh, specification and uh, when you look at a large software organization none of the designers or architects typically sit down and draw or document a finite state machine for you they typically write design or specifications as english statements and sometimes maybe some sketches and other diagrams and whenever they are missing and if you find them to be useful for testing as a tester the onus is on you to be able to draw finite state machines so it helps to get some idea of what exactly are finite state machines and what do they represent when it comes to modeling design of software right so one thing to note is that control flow graph which we learned how to draw that is not a finite state machine corresponding to any design or specification or even code it's not a finite state machine because control flow graph doesn't give you values associated with variables and states so it can never really be a finite state machine in the sense that we introduced it to be similarly call graphs which was another model that we saw when we saw design elements which talked about how one module calls another module the call graphs are also not not really finite state machines again because they don't depict data associated with states in the finite state machines what we need to do when we define finite state machines is that we need to consider values of variables that are present in the code each state of a finite state machine can be thought of as a tuple containing the values of the designated set of variables at any specified point in time and then transitions in the finite state machine tell you how when some statement in the program executes the values of one or more variable changes and how it affects these transitions so what we will do is that if you remember in the last lecture i had introduced you to this example q example and we looked at one sequencing constraint in the q so the class q typically comes with several methods that support operations on queues one method is that of nq where you add an element to the queue another method is dq where you remove an element from the queue and you could also do things like 
like methods which query and tell you is the queue empty is the queue full and so on so and we saw that a simple sequencing constraint like uh, for uh, dq to happen in nq should have happened in the past could be described and tested but more complex sequencing constraints saying that uh, the number of nqs at any point in time should be greater than or equal to the number of dqs cannot be tested by directly writing them as sequencing constraints we said last time that we would need finite state machines for testing them so what i'll do today is we'll look at this q example and i'll give you an idea about how a finite state machine for such a q abstract data type will look like and because uh, see when i talk about a q i need to implicitly assume a bound on the length of the q suppose i say i can keep adding to the q then in some sense the state space of the finite state machine will become infinite and it will no longer be finite state so queues we assume are of some bounded length for the sake of illustration to make things simple i've assumed that the length of the queue is just 2 right of course it doesn't correspond to a realistic model to make it realistic you could assume that the q is of fixed length n for some arbitrarily large n that you want it to be the same reasoning will extend for that length also so here is uh, a part of the code for the class q so what is a q q is a mutable bounded first in first out data structure i have assumed the bound to be 2 for the sake of simplicity so what could q look like it could be empty it could just have one object or it could have two objects we assume that these objects are not null and because it's first in first in first out the older elements are listed before the elements that are new in the queue so queue has things like size front and back and it also its main state element is that of an element we assume that the capacity of the size uh, queue is 2 okay, so initially size is 0 there's nothing in the front nothing in the back an element is something that i want to add now so there are two methods that i have in this slide i have presented nq method in this slide i have presented dq method of course the q class can have lot more methods like i told you you could have a method just checks if the q is empty you could have a method that checks if the q is full and so on i have not described all those methods for simplicity i have just given you nq and dq methods so we'll see what nq does so nq inserts an object o into the q and uh, whenever it is not possible to insert it could throw exceptions it throws a null pointer exception if the argument to be inserted is null we assume that the objects to be inserted are non null as i told you here we assume that o1 and o2 are never null and it throws an illegal state expression if the uh, queue is already full so it can't insert any more element into the queue so this is the code for the method it says if the object to be inserted is null you throw a null pointer exception or if the size is same as the capacity of the queue then you throw a illegal state exception otherwise you increase the size and add the uh, object over to the elements and increase the capacity is this clear what does dq do dq tries to remove the topmost element from the queue if the queue is empty and there's nothing to remove it will throw an exception illegal state exception otherwise it will remove the oldest element or the topmost element from the queue so if the size of the queue is zero then you throw illegal state exception otherwise you decrease the size you remove the object in the front because it's queue it's fee for first in first out and then you reset the new thing and uh, adjust the capacity accordingly and then the object that you removed you return that object so now suppose we have to model the queue the contents of a queue as a finite state machine what would be a correct approach the correct approach would be to first think about what is the state of the queue at any point in time remember that states in a finite state machine talk about the values of all the variables involved in a program or the design of a program and it actually depicts the existence the state of a system as it would exist in real life so when i look at the queue data structure what is its state its state is the contents of the queue what is the contents of the queue at any point in time Uh, so we don't really care about the specific objects in the queue all all that we want to know is that the, what are what is there in the queue 
the queue could be of size at most two so the queue could be empty there could be one non null object at the beginning of the queue front of the queue there could be one non null object at the back of the queue or the queue could be full with two non null objects right so these could be the four values of this variable element which describe the contents of the queue if you go back to the queue code queue consists of elements and the queue is of size 2 so all that i am tracking is what is the current content of the queue is the queue empty does the queue have one non null object does the queue have one non null object in the front or at the back does the queue have two non null objects so those are these values and then these are the states right so there could be several different states you can compute how many states would be there but about six of them would be reachable states what would be the transitions like for example suppose i had something like this object object which what, what are the methods or the method calls that will change the state of the queue will a method call which says is the queue empty change the state no right because what will is uh, the queue empty do it will basically look at the queue check whether it's empty or not if it's empty it will say true if it's non empty it will return false it's not going to be able to change the content of the queue but methods like nq and dq will change the state of the queue because they alter the variable elements they alter this variable elements when i nq i add something to the element when i dq i remove of something from the elements like for example here is a transition suppose i begin with null null that changes to object null when i nq an object and similarly when i dq an object if i if i have a full queue and i dq the topmost object that gets replaced with empty and then it becomes like this if the queue is of capacity 1 which it looks like this it has one non null object if i dq again then the queue changes to be a null queue right so this is how the state machine for a queue would look like i haven't really drawn the state machine pictorially i would like to leave that as a small exercise for you to do assume that these are the states of a state machine and draw edges to depict the change of states and label those edges with method names like nq and dq which tell you when you do an nq and when you do a dq how the state changes in terms of elements getting added or removed from the queue respectively try and draw this finite state machine as a small exercise that you could do for yourself now when it comes to testing as i told you any kind of graph coverage criteria that deals with structural coverage criteria can be used except for prime paths we specifically use no coverage edge coverage edge pair coverage and specified path coverage when it comes to finite state machine coming up with test paths for these coverage criteria can be non trivial because you have to solve for the actions and the guards that come in the state machine we will deal with it when we look at how to solve logical predicates next week we will also see some more examples of concrete finite state machine as we move on in the course So that's all I wanted to talk to you about finite state machines. I'll briefly spend some time looking at some part of UML diagrams and tell you that the coverage criteria that we have seen till now can also be used to test UML diagrams. UML in short for unified modeling language is a very popular modeling language used for modeling designs of systems. There are about 14 or 17 UML diagrams and here are the ones that look a lot like graphs, state machines, state charts, activity diagrams. They are basically some special kinds of graphs and the kind of coverage criteria that we have seen, specifically path coverage criteria specified path coverage criteria can be used to test most of these graphs right one is to think to be noted is that each of this graph is very different from a typical control flow graph so you have to be careful when we define test cases and path coverage criteria on them as i told you i really won't be able to do uml now for most part of the course if time permits towards the end of the course maybe we could look at uml diagrams and see is testing specific to uml diagrams We've come to an end of graph-based testing. Next week onwards, I will begin logic predicate-based testing. Here is a quick recap of what we have seen till now. The primary structure or model that we worked with for the past three weeks was that of graphs.
the two main kinds of coverage criteria that we saw on graphs were structural coverage criteria and data flow coverage criteria. We defined these coverage criteria purely graph theoretically, right? We saw what are the various structural coverage criteria. If you want to list them, we saw node coverage, edge coverage, edge pair coverage, complete path coverage, specified path coverage, prime path coverage. Then we saw subsumption, how each coverage criteria subsumes one or more of the other. Then we augmented graphs with data, specifically with data definitions and data uses. Then we saw what are called def use paths or DU paths. And then we saw three main data flow coverage criteria, all defs coverage, all uses coverage, and all DU paths coverage. Then what we did was we applied this graph coverage criteria that we learned to source code, to design and to specification. In source code, we specifically learned how to draw control flow graph for various code snippets applied them to a full example and saw how the various structural coverage criteria can be used to test CFGs. Then we augmented CFGs with defs and uses and saw how to use data flow coverage criteria on this augmented CFG. Then we moved on to design. I gave you the basics of design integration testing. Then we saw call graphs and saw how to apply structural coverage criteria on call graphs. Then we saw coupling DU pairs, variables that are defined in one, used in the other, right, from the actual parameter to formal parameter, from a caller method to a callee method, and augmented this data flow coverage criteria to coupling variables. Finally, in the last couple of lectures, we saw how to use graph coverage criteria on specifications. I told you how to use graph coverage criteria to model and test sequencing constraints. And in today's lecture, we saw finite state machines. This week's assignment will deal with this part. I'll give you assignments that talk about data flow, coverage criteria, design and specifications. Next week, I'll upload a video on how to solve that assignment. Please try to do it before you see the video once. It'll give you good practice. And that will be the end of graph coverage criteria for this part of the course. We will move on to looking at logical predicates define what are the coverage criteria on logical predicates and how to apply them to code and to specifications. Thank you.